There are people in your life who amaze you. They're rare. You can usually count them on one hand. The cool thing is, these people are really easy to pick out. Every time you talk to them, they're doing something more incredible than you ever thought possible. Kyle Smitley is one of those amazing people in my life. She's a DePauw double major, geology and philosophy, from Defiance, Ohio. We officially became friends after I graduated. She actually hired me to build a website, barley, her, build her website barleyandbirch.com. But I have a hunch we may have been friends beforehand, as she may have been witness to one of my early college year boulder runs. <laughs> Thanks for not holding that against me, Kyle. Since our first project, I've been lucky to stay in contact with Kyle. Our conversations are typically short, interrupted, and scattered. But whether we're talking about what it's like to work with Dwight Schrute at one of her clinics in Haiti, or maybe just some tech advice on how to have a meeting in the Steve Jobs living room, or what it takes to be in a relationship and also on the, in, in Inc. Magazine's top 30 under 30, I always leave these conversations in awe. And all of this from a DePaul geology and philosophy double major from Defiance, Ohio. Please allow me to introduce my friend, my mentor, and tonight's distinguished, amazing speaker, Kyle Smitley. Uh, Kyle has prepared a short talk, and she'll be followed by a question and answer with Dr. McCall. So, without further ado. Thank you, Ryan, for such a nice introduction. Thank you all so much for coming. It's such an honor to be back at DePauw in Historic East College. When I was preparing to speak, I thought about when I was a wide-eyed 16-year-old from Defiance, Ohio, a tiny town, and I remember walking through the creaky hallways here and up the quiet staircases and thinking and looking at my father and saying, I feel like I'm in Harry Potter. This is amazing. And it was neat because my father's parents actually met here, my grandparents. My grandfather, Gordon Smitley, had just returned from World War II. He was a beta and four years older than most of his classmates. <laughs> Betas. <laughs> Legend has it that while at DePauw, my grandfather had a full wet bar built into the back of his station wagon to make tailgating a little easier. My grandmother, Patricia Longley, was from Oak Park, Illinois. She and her sister were both Kappas here. Their names are still in, on bricks in the smoking room at the Kappa house. I hope I'm even allowed to say that. So when I was 16 and my dad said, what about DePauw? I said, De where? Dad, I'm clearly torn between Harvard and Ohio State. Harvard if I want to be really smart and Ohio State if I just want to party. My father, my father went to Wittenberg, but still insisted that we visit Greencastle before I made my final decision. So we visited, and to my surprise, the kids here were just as fun as the Ohio State kids and just as smart as the Harvard kids. So of course, I was sold. So when I was preparing to give this talk, someone said, well, why don't you just tell them about a typical day in the life of an entrepreneur? I always sort of laugh when someone asks me to do this because there really isn't one. But I figured since you're DePaul kids and you understand what it's like to have a hectic day, I would just pick a day and write down everything I did and then share it with you all. Uh, so this is my work day on Friday, February 14th. I woke up at six and ran 11 miles. I had a staff conference call while scarfing a spinach smoothie and an entire pot of coffee. I triaged the 1,500 emails that I'd received since 10 p.m. the night before. I spoke with our graphic designer about an infographic on deworming. I spoke with the expeditionary learning team, which is a focus on charter schools. I read a report on a 30,000 square foot building in Detroit. I approved the Barley and Birch Summer 2012 collection color palette. I returned a call from Save the Children. I considered having lunch. I looked for local flour and olive oil suppliers in Napa, California. I made some more calls, I sent some more emails, I reviewed a Detroit Public School's recent press release, I cleaned my chicken coop, I took a break before dinner to roller skate with my two sweet 100 pound rescue pit bulls, I had dinner with a foundation board member to discuss our bylaws, I watched The Bachelor and texted my best friend, 
I spent, and then while the rest of the world was sleeping, from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., I returned emails and I reworked my to-do list for the next day. I spent my Saturday morning catching up on only emails from staffers, foundation board members, donors, customers, family and friends, press, and entrepreneurs looking for advice. Then I ended my 39-hour workday at 9 p.m. on a Saturday night in a biker bar in East Oakland, watching my friend's band perform, surrounded by a lot of people with neck and facial tattoos. That was one workday. That's the life of a young entrepreneur. Every day is totally different. It's just as ridiculous, and it's just as super fun to live. What's funny to me is that these antics have garnered calls from the likes of CNN, Fast Company, People Magazine, among many others. Every time I stand in a room of ridiculously talented and ridiculously famous millionaires and world changers, and they're asking me how I manage to fit every single thing into my day, I sort of smile and I think, I've been doing this since 2003. I'm a pro. So before I talk about what I do in the real world, I wanted to talk a little about my time at Tapa. When I started at Tapa, I wanted to either direct movies or write for the Rolling Stone. Those were the only two options I was really willing to consider. Basically though, my one mission while here was just to try all the things that I hadn't had a chance to do in my tiny little high school in Ohio. I didn't have a clue what philosophy was, and I was pretty sure that geology was the study of where things were on maps. It's not. So my first semester at DePauw, I signed up for two classes, Intro to Philosophy with Eric Wielenberg and Intro to Geology with Jeannie Pope. They both went on to be my wonderful advisors. While at DePauw, I was also a DJ at WGRE every semester, as well as a director. I should also note here that under my watch, we went from number six to number one in the nation. <laughs> I directed for the Playwrights Festival, took cello lessons, and I wrote for the DePauw. I proudly rushed Pi Fi, and I was the most excited chant leader. I was the most excited chant leader ever. I wrote in Little Five, and I was a volunteer coordinator with the Humane Society. I studied abroad in New Zealand. I went on winter term in-service trips. I was a swim coach at North Putnam. I was a proud Posse Plus retreat member. This might seem like sort of a lot, I get it, but it was actually pretty normal for a DePauw student, and I suspect that it still is. In 2007, I graduated. I was a double major, double minor, mega involved, super exhausted. I went to work in DC for a bit, then I hopped off to San Diego with the express intention of doing nothing. I was lucky enough to get a perfect score on my LSAT, thereby being offered a flexible job with the test prep company Kaplan, who said they'd pay me enough to cover my rent if I would just tutor some of their students for a few hours each week. It was the best. Surf, yoga, tutor, surf, eat fish tacos on the beach, go to bed, repeat. In my spare time, in between my very stressful daily activities, I'd been asked to do some research about the children's product industry. I looked into everything from mattresses to pacifiers to clothing. It was all relatively horrifying, but the apparel industry was the worst. People would say, hey, this is organic, but, and what that means is that it's really good for your kid and it's also saving the world. But I'd look into it and they were lying. The clothing was sewn in sweatshops, it was dyed using heavy metals, and it was printed with chemical-laden plastics, most of which have been banned in Europe for years and they're just now being banned in the United States. I also saw that these companies were making a ton of money. And the crazy part to me was that they were doing nothing good with it. They were buying yachts and Escalades and whatever rich people do with their money. So <clears throat> I just spent time in Central America and Haiti, and I knew how little money, money it took to make a really tremendous impact. I was also a broke college grad, and I didn't even have a little money to make that impact. So the solution was pretty clear. I would kill two birds with one stone. I would start a company to give parents a very high quality, safe option for their kids, and I would use a small amount of money that I would make to donate to organizations all over the world to make a huge difference. I told myself that if I could make enough money to buy some books for some, gr some girls I remembered from Nicaragua, that everything would be a win. So I did it. I just decided that I would start a company. <laughs> I did research, made a lot of phone calls, and made even more mistakes. I took out a business loan, and I bootstrapped every single cent of it. I knew nothing about business, like I repeat, 
nothing about business. And I stood firmly on the principle that kindness, humility, and hard work would create the best possible brand. By the end of our first year in business, we had already won a slew of Parents' Choice Awards for Best Kids Clothing, and we were carried in over 100 stores worldwide. By year two, we were featured in magazines ranging from People to Inc. to Forbes. By year three, we announced the creation of our own foundation, and we built and opened a children's home and a school in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Starting and running Barley and Birch was a lot of fun, and it's a lot of fun to talk about, but it was a ton of work. And it took a ton of perseverance and a lot of dedication. While it's fun to talk about our accomplishments and the good that we've done, I've worked my ass off for every single inch of it. Every day there is still a setback, and every day I figure out how to brush myself off and move past it, while smiling and patting others on the back, and maybe having an occasional beer, and then figuring out my next move. And I realized I learned that at DePa. And I think that this is where the most important part comes in, that times weren't always so cheery for me at DePa. It was difficult to be here sometimes. I almost transferred to Ohio State and Harvard, I think at least once each. There were intense social pressures to be thin and pretty and have appropriately colored polos, pumps, and pearls to go out every Friday, Saturday, Wednesday, and Thursday. <laughs> and of course, there were academic pressures. I was in two very male-dominated majors, and I was never the smartest person in the class. I never got the top grade, and I never had the best questions. In fact, a professor once told me that I was a step below bimbo. It felt sometimes that I was in a horrible bubble, that it was difficult and frustrating and a lot of hard work on a lot of different levels, right? Pulling all-nighters in the geoscience lab to get a map done so I could go to my house's flower inn and then like 12 meetings and classes the next day was so intense and so commonplace. I also had two hugely horrible moments at DePa that I wanted to share with all of you. My sophomore year, my application to study geology in New Zealand, a geologic marvel in itself, was denied on account of the lack of connection between the location and the subject matter. I was devastated. Then, my senior year, I was turned down by Teach for America. I took both of these setbacks the same, crying uncontrollably in my room at Pi Phi, asserting to my friend that my life was over. But it wasn't. Recently, I wanted to share a story with you. Recently, at an event in DC a few months ago, I spoke, just a talk, just like this. I gave the usual talk about my business, my goals, our achievements so far. I talked about my vision for the foundation and the fantastic things that we had planned. Afterwards, a woman approached me and she said, that was amazing, you're inspiring. I can't wait to watch you change the world, change Haiti, change the city of Detroit. I looked at her name tag said Wendy Cobb, Teach for America, founder and CEO. <laughs> I said, thank you. And I just need to tell you this. <laughs> Your group rejected me, and it took me years for my self-esteem to recover, I think. I was being serious. You guys think that's funny. <laughs> and she and a couple other top members who were with her sort of just looked at me. They were kind of confused and they were kind of shocked. And she said, I don't know if that was our best or our worst decision ever. And it occurred to me then that that was what I wanted to share with you all tonight. So Vernon Jordan referred to a John F. Kennedy quote about one alma, one's alma mater being the second home of our youth. So I thought it was a perfect way of thinking about it. I referred, or I think of you all as sort of my younger siblings, right? And that's how I'm speaking to you tonight. So, here I am today. I proudly spend three days a week volunteering my legal skills for undocumented immigrants that are victims of violence. I own a children's clothing company that I started and ran while I was a full-time law student. Last year, I graduated from law school and I started a foundation that built a children's home and a school in Haiti. Last week, I dewormed all 3.2 million children in Haiti. Next week, I will launch my new company. Next month, I'm running the Boston Marathon. And next year, my charter school in Detroit will open, as well as my clinic in Port-au-Prince, which will be the first ever children's and prenatal clinic in all of Haiti. It's a lot, right? 
but nothing more intense than my list that I read about what I did at DePauw. I have lunch in the West Wing, and I have dinner at Steve Jobs' house. My dog plays with Mark Zuckerberg's dog, and I text celebrities about their children's potty training situation. I'm living a very fun and very ridiculous life, because I think life is meant to be lived and maxed out at every moment, like you all do here at DePauw. And so that's what I wanted to tell you all, as my siblings, that you have an incredible skill set to do the exact same thing. And I've met enough people, the creme de la creme of the world, to tell you that for certain. And I'm telling you that not many people have what you have. You're brilliant, you're charming, you're funny. You have an unparalleled work ethic. You're secretly at a super competitive school, I know you are, with a lot of pressures that other people don't have added on top of your schoolwork. You handle setbacks with a smile, looking good, with an intense perseverance to do better the next time. You do your homework and you socialize with the same fervor. That's the real world. So my challenge to you all, and my hope, is that in five years, for me to no longer be considered distinguished. In fact, I hope in a few years, I receive an email saying that I've been invited back to DePauw to give a lecture in the most boring and average alumni lecture series. I hope you all stay humble and kind and tough and that you graduate and make the most of your life just as you have at DePauw. I can't wait to hear about it. Thank you. from the communication department. And uh, Kyle and I will have a little discussion for a while, a couple things I'd still like to know. Uh, but also keep in mind, we're gonna have an opportunity for you all to join the fun in a little bit. So while we're discussing, think of things that you'd like to know about Kyle, or <laughs> questions that she could clarify for you uh, that she hasn't already discussed, uh, or maybe, uh, maybe things she has talked about but that you still wanna know more about. Um, so be thinking about those. In a little while, we'll pause and you can up, come up to the microphone and get in line to talk to Kyle Smitley, the legend. <laughs> Please uh, do. And I hope that uh, you all saw the DePaul Magazine last semester that came out that had Kyle on the front of it. So will you be autographing afterwards? Signed copies will be available. Oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> um, one thing you did not mention about your WGRE experience, <laughs> and, and uh, you are the person who designed that rather iconic WGRE poster of I the was. guy standing on the boulder with a guitar. Uh, that is still posted in Marvin's and in various places around campus. Is it, has anyone seen that? Or you can just nod and humor well, me. I know it's at the WGRE <laughs> studios still. Yes, you have. Um, you want to talk about that poster just for a second? Because, I mean, you live on here at Marvin's. I, I mean, it was amazing. So I went to Marvin's last night, obviously. It's the first thing I do when I get into town. And I'm in line at Marvin's. And the guy taking my order, I said, do you like that poster? And he was like, yeah. Fine. And I was like, ah, I made it. And I was with my best friend, and he was like, cool, use thin crust cheese pizza. I mean, what did you want? And we, and so then later he saw me taking pictures of my cell phone with it. And he said, wait, did you seriously make that poster? And I said, yes. And he said, that's awesome. And so I felt very cool. <laughs> well, that is exciting. Um, and it's... And it's been exciting for WGRE listeners for a long time. Now let me, let me talk about, you, you listed off some of the magazines that you've been you know, featured in and whatnot, and you know that 30 under 30 thing, you know, listed as one of America's coolest entrepreneurs and Fortune magazine, and uh, being one of the business owners invited to the White House and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Does it ever just strike you as like, who is this person? Do you ever like have this kind of sense that you're like outside looking in and yeah. Can you picture that you've done these yeah. things and, no. you know, been at the White House and places like no. that? No, I have so many ridiculous stories about me just still acting like a DePauw student um, in really high-pressure situations because I just still can't really believe it, like being caught in security at the White House because I had a small metal container that was pickle-flavored toothpicks in my purse that my mom <laughs> gave me as, as a stocking stuffer, and it was at this very important event, and I'm like, who am I to be invited to these events? <laughs> it's perpetual every single day of my life, I think. 
I'm glad I'm doing really good things for the world, but people really need to stop taking me seriously. <laughs> You know, you talked a lot about the things you did at DePaul and how busy you were and whatnot. DePaul, I think, has the opportunity for people who take full advantage of the experience here. DePaul can be that incubator, you know, to get people the opportunity to learn about leadership or to learn how to manage themselves and, you know, to be intellectually challenged and whatnot. Would you expand a little bit more on that notion of DePaul as the incubator? And how do we, as, you know, stu for st fellow students out there right now, how do they take full advantage of the DePaul experience, but without having it, you know, overcome them either with worry or being so busy that they can't get anything accomplished. Yeah, I think the coolest part about my DePaul experience, just I guess speaking specifically, was being in a leadership position in a club, um, being, a, being a director at WGRE, I was the, on the promotion, I was director of promotions. And so I got to kind of sit and think, what do I want to do? Okay, I want to make a poster. I want to make t-shirts. I want to make pens. Um, and that club was kind of unanimous across the board with all positions. I mean, everyone is ha everyone's on a, something. Everyone has a club. Everyone's thought about what to put on a t-shirt. I think the ability to kind of think critically about a decision that you're making and kind of see that, you know, and then also be in a meeting and have your opinion be unpopular or be just how DePaul teaches you to interact with other people, I think is just really special and how it teaches you to kind of trust your intuition. Um, and it really, I think, hones that in because you see the time that you thought something was one way and you realized you were completely wrong and you had no idea what you were talking about and that you should eat humble pie and say, I was an idiot, I didn't know what I was talking about. And to kind of refine that skill in undergrad and not have to do it in the real world is, is really special because there's still plenty of people out there in the real world that are in their 30s that don't have that skill yet. So um, I think that's the ability to kind of trust your instincts and hone them is just unparalleled here. You know, when you left DePaul, uh, and you talked about your progress through your career, there were any number of places where you clearly took some risks, right. okay? Uh, is that something that uh, you just developed through your life? Is that something instinctive? A lot of people wouldn't have the nerve to just take off and do the things you did. I mean, like, to be trying to create a company while in law school, to be taking out this loan and burning yeah. it all up, and then, like, can we make this go or not? And, and of course, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who try to go and never get there, but. Talk about that risk-taking thing. That's got to be scary at times. Yeah, it's so scary. I think um, just to be really foolish all the time and just to do it. Um, one of my heroes uh, is the founder of the Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard. He's basically my Justin Bieber. And he once said, you know, once you have an idea, if you think about it twice, it's stale and you're going to not be ahead of the game anymore. So I think having the kind of just gut instinct to have an idea and just say, I'm doing it and this is happening and... And then also having the common sense when you take a risk and it's just not gonna work to pull out and just be done with it. Um, and that has happened a lot and I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs get into problems is they get married to an idea and in the back of their mind they know they need to tweak it and they know they need to adjust it but they're just maybe too proud and they don't have, I, I'm not sure, but um, kind of the, the confidence just to say that was really dumb, we're not gonna do it anymore. And I've done that, I, do, I think I do that once a day. Um, I, so I think, yeah, taking risk is really scary, and I think DePaul did a really good job of, I guess, fostering this confidence in me when I was living in this DePaul bubble that I could just do whatever I wanted, and I could just walk over here and just look the president in the eye and say, you're, you think you're fixing Haiti, I'll, I'll explain how you should fix it, which is so stupid. Who's, who says things like that? But I think DePaul did a really good job of fostering this confidence that would then bring on some risk-taking. Mm -hmm. so. You know, you, you've... Uh had philanthropy in your mind for a long time, and you didn't, I don't think you mentioned this in your presentation, but while you were in school here, you went back and forth to Indianapolis to uh, Riley's Children's Hospital, and you read and worked with uh, children cancer patients, mm -hmm. uh, and you've carried on that uh, other-centeredness, you know, into your career now. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, like, what motivates you to try to reach out to other folks, and that, you know, and that, that you can do that at the same time as still you know, working your company and yeah. getting ready for the Boston Marathon and stuff like that. Jeez. So I think when it hit me most, I think it hit me at a lot of different times, but when you can look at someone and they are you, you know, they're the exact same person as you, they were born in a different place. Um, 
and you can just see how different your lives are and you can see what happens when you, and it doesn't even have to be financial and it doesn't even have to be international, but when you can look at them and you can say, I see what you're doing and I care and I wanna do something about it and I wanna help you and I want, I'm concerned. I think when, you, when you're able to engage with another human like that on any level, whether it's like you mentioned my like seven year olds with cancer or if it's my kids in Haiti it, it, or anywhere um, or my kids in Detroit, like any, and anywhere, when you can engage and you can just say, like, let's do this together and you feel this really deep sense of humanity and you feel this sense of comfort.